Hi, everybody. Welcome to our second interview show. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to clarify that we're taping in Montpelier, Vermont, which is unceded indigenous land. And now let's move to my first interview of the show with uh, my esteemed friend, Stephen Dansky, who has a very illustrious biography, and I'd like to share some of it with you now. Stephen is a writer, photographer, and activist. He was an initial member of the Gay Liberation Front in New York City in 1969 after the Stonewall Rebellion. He worked on the GLF newspaper, Come Out. In 1970, he wrote Hey Man, a polemical essay that was published in Come Out, Gay Flames, and Rat. The controversial essay of gay male sexism, it was critical of gay male sexism and advocated gay male living collectives and supported the right of gay men to be involved in raising children. He was the founder of the movement of anti-sexist pro-feminist men called a feminism that published a feminist manifesto considered to be an historic document. And if we have time in the interview, I'd like to talk a little more about this. But there's more. Stephen was active in the HIV AIDS pandemic as an activist, healthcare administrator, psychotherapist, and volunteer in underserved communities, such as Harlem and the South Bronx. He is the author of two books, how Dare Everything, Tales of HIV-Related Psychotherapy, and Nobody's Children, Orphans of the HIV Epidemic. He's also the author of Bearing Witness, Images and Reflections of the LGBT Movement, 1969 through 71, a collection of essays, photographs, and speeches. He's a frequent contributor to the Gay and Lesbian Review Worldwide, and I've read several of his essays, and I can testify to their critical insight. Uh, the Feminist Movement was published in the anthology Smash the Church, Smash the State, The Early Years of Gay Liberation. A short story, Broken Gender, was published in Gertrude, a journal of voice and vision in 2006. As a photographer, Stephen has exhibited in New York and Las Vegas, Nevada, in a group show, More Than Meets the Eye, one person shows in public, Studies from the Street, and Shelter from the Storm, the Chelsea Hotel in 2011. He curated Gay Liberation Front, a 40th anniversary retrospective in New York in 2009. He was married in Williamstown, Mass. In 2004, on the first day in the first state that same-sex marriage became legal anywhere in America, he lives with his spouse, Barry Saffron, in Canaan, New York, and Las Vegas, Nevada. And there's more. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you. It's delightful Thank to have you Las here. Vegas. You're still, you're in Las Vegas now? Yes. Staying in your apartment like the rest of us? We had, we made a trip to New York in February, the last week of February. And when we flew back to Las Vegas, it was clear that there was an epidemic. It hadn't been declared a pandemic as yet. And we have been stay at home since uh, the beginning of March, the first week of March. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean I don't go out. I do go out because I'm involved in a couple of projects, working on a new documentary called Attend Me, a pandemic journal. Um, and so I've been doing a lot of uh, videotaping on the streets of Las Vegas in an area called 18B, which is covered with street art. Um, That's wonderful. Well, tell us about your current projects because you, I think of you now as a filmmaker, even though you have many other, um, professions? Well, the project that I've been working on for the last five years is something called Outspoken, Oral History from LGBTQ Pioneers. And to date, I have interviewed over a hundred uh, people across the country in every city. 
well, not every city, but across the country and also globally. Um, these are uh, videotaped interviews with people who are self-defined pioneers. That is not my role to put a, an imprimatur on people as mm -hmm. to whether or not they're a pioneer. I leave that up to the interviewee. Um, but I've interviewed gay men, lesbians, transgender, queer folk, um, and all these interviews, all 100, are on a dedicated website. It's my belief that these oral histories should be accessible to anyone who has the internet. Often, um, though I'm a huge supporter of archives, they're not always accessible to the general public. So it's on a dedicated website. You can go to www.outspoken-lgbtq.org and uh, you can look at any of the interviews there. They're all alphabetized. But I've also decided that all content should be archived. And so I've had an agreement with one in Los Angeles <clears throat> on the campus of the University of Southern California in, La in LA, to, which is the largest um, LGBTQ archive in the world. And all content also resides there. So anyone who's doing research can go to the website, but if people are in an archive like one, they have access to all, uh, all the material for the past five years. And then from that project, I evolved to wanting to make a documentary of the project itself, not the process of making the, the um, interviews or doing the, the oral history itself, but taking clips of as many people as I could, representative of the, the body of work, into a, a full-length film that's an hour and a half long. It's a 90-minute film. Um, it's called From Trauma to Activism. And the, the idea from trauma to activism is that all of us have suffered the oppression, both in terms of race, in terms of gender identity, in terms of sexual orientation. And from that hurt, from those wounds, from them, that trauma, we've evolved into activists. So I wanted to show how people can come from a very painful place and transform that experience into something else that is both healing to the individual who suffered, but very instructional to, to people who are going through very similar experiences of discrimination, oppression. I remember we brought that film to the Kellogg Hubbard Library here in Montpelier. It was a great success. So the, I, don't, I don't have a distributor. It's available on Vimeo On Demand. And you, you can't download or purchase the film, but for 99 cents, you can look at that film for 72 hours. That's and a good deal. Say it again. That's a good deal. It's a good deal, 99 cents. You, and to have it on video on demand, you have to charge something. So I charged as little as possible. And the film has been, been screened in New York City, in San Francisco, in Montpellier, in Las Vegas, in San Diego, um, in, in many cities. So that's available for people to look at, or if an LGBT center would like to have a screening of it, it's 99 cents. <laughs> well, our, the biography I read began with the Gay Liberation Front. Would you talk a little more about your pre-gay liberation front days, the history before you became a gay liberation front member? And then I think you left it, but you tell us. Well, I grew up in the Bronx in, in the 1950s and mil my milieu was the street. And I lived on the street, the apartments, in, in the South Bronx were very small, and in, especially in the summer months, you would go out to the street. So my earliest memories of activism uh, date back to when I was um, uh, in pre-puberty. Pre and I was a supporter of Adlai Stevenson for president in 1952 when I was eight years old. I had made a poster, walked across the South Bronx to deliver this poster to the Democratic Club. So I. I consider uh, activism in my DNA. 
uh, but the big change that occurred for me in terms of my consciousness was when I moved to the Lower East Side. And when I moved to the Lower East Side, I became very involved in leftist politics. When I was at City College in New York, I was a member of Students for Democratic Society, SDS. Um, on the Lower East Side, I pur pur purchased a mimeograph machine that wasn't uh, electric. It was a hand cranked mime machine, mimeograph machine. If anyone knows that very primitive technology, you take a tube of ink that looks like a huge tube of toothpaste, you squeeze the ink out onto a drum, you put a stencil over it, and then you hand crank, crank it, and paper goes through, and you have, you have um, leaflets. So for a penny, I used to go out on the streets of the Lower East Side uh, as a reporter um, and sell um, issues of Peace La Paz, a bilingual community newspaper. And that's what I was doing before uh, Gay Liberation Front. Um, when the Stonewall Rebellion happened, I went to my first meeting in August, which was about, mm, about a month or so after the Stonewall uh, Rebellion in the village. And I was, I can't explain what this, I had felt that I had come home. I had been involved in politics, as I said, all my life, but I was never at home. And when I came to Gay Liberation Front, as chaotic and as contentious as that organization was, it really was where I belonged. So uh, my early days in GLF were, trying to find a radical ideology that made sense in terms of sexual orientation. There had been nothing before. And Come Out newspaper was the first newspaper that came out of Gay Liberation Front. It was the first newspaper in the early LGBT movement. And I wrote an essay, which you mentioned in my bio, called Hey Man. I never thought that essay would have a life. But just last year, it was republished in the Stonewall Reader, Penguin Books. It was edited by Jason Bauman, who is um, at the New York Public Library. Um, and what I got, what the big treat about, about Hey Man was to hear it read on audi Audible. So I got to hear someone reading the essay. I was stunned by it because the language is not at all the way I would write now. Not that I wouldn't engage in hyperbolic, hyperbolic language. It was just I wouldn't have used terms like cop privilege. It just was, is not the way I talk now. But in that era, that was the zeitgeist. That is how we spoke. And um, we wanted to shock people. A, a lot of leftist politics was shocking. When you think of guerrilla theater, that's, that's shocking. Uh, so. A lot of the work that I did in, in those early years has survived 50 years forward. Um, it's quite a surprise to me. And then from, from Gay Liberation Front, um, while I was there, I discovered the works of some major feminists. So I had read The Sexual Dialectic by Kate Millat and um, Sexual politics? I'm sorry, sexual politics by Kate Millet and the sexual dialectic by Shulamith Firestone. And, and I, was, I was just thinking of that today, the dialectic of sex. Dialectic of she sex. introduced me to the idea of children's liberation. And when I was reading your A Feminist Manifesto, your last point involves men participating in childcare. But anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Not at all. I think it's a very important point. Uh, and then I, I had read the anthology Sister is Powerful and the Red Stockings Manifesto. These were the things that, that greatly influenced me. And what happened after I learned of, of feminism, it was the experience that, that um, Emily Dickinson describes when she was asked, what is poetry? And she says, when the top of your head blows off, you know it's poetry. And that's how I felt about feminism. I felt that this was a, a theory, an ideology, a struggle for liberation that made total sense to me. And I have had the same belief since uh, the early 70s till now that if we don't end the patriarchy, if the patriarchy isn't 
dismembered, oops, pardon the expression, but if the patriarchy isn't taken down, this planet will not survive. So it was so awe-inspiring to me. And, and then um, that's what triggered feminism. I felt that men could actually be supportive without getting in the way of women's struggles, but actually be supportive of the struggle. And so I began to do childcare. Um, the two children that I've taken care of, I'm gonna to start to cry. One, one was the son of uh, Robin Morgan, mm -hmm. well-known feminist writer, poet, and Kenneth Pitchford, who just died two weeks ago, um, the, the poet, Pen Kenneth Pitchford, and John Knabel, um, who is still quite active in, in terms of LGBT politics. Um, we formed the effeminist, but I began that relationship of doing childcare for Blake. And I'm still uh, friends with him. He was six months old when I met him and I had never changed a diaper in my life, but the technology had advanced to Pampers. So that was much easier than cloth diapers, except the Pampers, um, that currently have tabs where you can close them with a tab. They had uh, safety pins. And I, I was always afraid that I would make a mistake with the safety pin and I would stab him right to the heart and kill him. <laughs> of course that didn't happen. <laughs> um, but it meant, what it meant is that I had to learn about the care of another human being. I had never done that before. A base, one of the basis is, uh, tenets of feminism is that we should be involved in life giving, perhaps not biologic life giving, but the creativity of art, the child raising, um, the support of women in, in their struggle. That's all about life giving. Um, well, I just was able to read the a Feminist Manifesto and it's full of really revolutionary ideas. I, read an, I heard an interview with Kenneth Pitchford who said that um, it didn't really take, some of them haven't really caught on. But I think the culture has changed in many different ways. Um, what was the immediate impact of your publishing this? Did you leave the Gay Liberation Front then over questions of uh, gender and sexual? Well, over questions of male domination, but, but also that, that at the point in which uh, we made a declaration of leaving, uh, GLF was really falling apart because at that point, um, many of the lesbian feminists had left and formed la radical lesbians. So the organization was beginning to dissolve. Um, um, believe it or not, we're running out of time. Oh my goodness. It's, I know it. You'll have to come back because we have so much more to talk about. Let me about just say that. something about the manifesto. Please. One of the things about writing a manifesto, I warn you all if you decide you want to do that, is that it's a non-negotiable document. However, almost 50 years later, I'm, negoti I'm still negotiating some of the statements of the manifesto. And in particular, I no longer hold any view that is anti-transgender. I became a psychotherapist. Um, I joined a practice in upstate New York in Albany, New York with Arlene Istar Lev. And the clients I had were only transgender. And it completely changed my thinking, sitting opposite someone and hearing the authenticity of how they viewed their gender identity changed my mind completely. So I wanted to mention that that's one of the things that I've, um, I've tried to discuss whenever the Feminist Manifesto comes up. I know. And the thing about the beauty and limitation of a manifesto is that it's of the time. Um, how do you feel about camp? Well, I, th I think, you know, I believe in, in uh, I'm a, of identity politics, and I believe there's a gay sensibility. I mean, I, I've always believed that. Um, so... I wrote an essay for the Gay and Lesbian Review on camp, and I tried to do a historical perspective. I have no issue with camp as long as it's not mocking women. But camp can very easily be thought as mocking certain kinds of ma masculinity. It, it's very easy to do a camp impersonation of John Wayne, if people still know who 
with that horrible <laughs> thing there. That, um, so I think, you know, I, I liked camp. I think camp is part of Stephen Dansky's humor. Um, I don't have much of an opportunity to do that because uh, the generation that had that kind of humor is is dying off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that, that camp humor still exists in the same way, but I don't, I don't have any problem with camp. Are there any last words that you want to share with the audience? Well, I thank you and Linda for doing this program. Uh, th these are all labors of love. They, I know that sounds like a cliche, but I really mean that. These take, take over your life in ways, these types of projects really t overwhelm and take over your life. And um, sometimes we don't always get the support that we need to continue this work. But I think if, if it's very much in, your, in how you view yourself, you will be able to do it without support. And I do most of my work alone and I, I sort of create within a, a, a bubble. Um, but I thank you and Linda for doing this because I know what it takes to do this. And I wanted to express my appreciation to you. And thank you for your work as well. It's been tireless and um, wide ranging. And I'd love to have you back to talk more about it. I would love it. Thank you so much. So we are back to talk with Mara Iverson. First, we want to acknowledge that we are indeed taping in Montpelier, which is unceded indigenous land. This time, however, we're gonna to talk to Mara not about Outright and her role as Director of Education. Mara is a community appointed member of the Ethnic and Social Equity Studies Work Group. This is based on some very high profile legislation that occurred. Mm -hmm. But we really wanna talk with Mara about what this group is truly charged to do, how that process is going, and what might be happening next. So Mara, my understanding was that there was a coalition that formed around this issue to support the legislation. Mm -hmm. And it was this group of people who were responsible for appointing you, thank you yes. very much, to this, this work group. So can you tell me some about that coalition, how it came together and what's happening with it now? Yeah, absolutely. So the coalition came together. Um, it's the Vermont Coalition for um, Ethnic and Social Equity Studies in Schools. That is not the correct uh, list of the words, but if you put those keywords into Google, you'll find them. Um, and it was a group that came about because there were concerned parents and community members who knew that for a long time, school curriculums and the way that we do work in schools and the way that we even have set up schools erases a lot of um, identities and a lot of contributions that people have made outside of the history of like straight, white, cisgender, middle class, landowning men. Um, and specifically in the United States. So the group was really focused on trying to find ways to get schools to make changes. And the uh, predominant way to do that was to go about some legislation that would um, set different expectations for um, what sorts of things ought to be covered in schools so that we have a broader and more complete picture of history and of the way that the world came to be that it is and of the people who contributed and built it. So yeah, and, that was the that was the goal. And this bill was the one that was initially introduced by Kaya Morris. Yes. And then was reintroduced by Coach Christie when Kaya did not run for re-election. So so exactly can you give us a sample of the groups, organizations that are part of that coalition? Who, do, who does it truly represent? 
Yeah, absolutely. It is possible for, for people to be in that coalition, even just as individuals. So people who are passionate about the cause can join even as individuals. But um, Voices for Vermont's Children and um, the, uh, of course, my brain just gap confused absolutely evaporated right there um i was on it as as part of outright and representing the lgbt um youth community um but various organizations that fight for um recognition racial equity liberation um are the groups that are represented overall and there was the commitment to ensure that under, underrepresented communities had a room at the table. You know, Palestinians living in the U.S., Islamic Muslim community, the Jewish community, the indigenous community, the Latinx community. And not just the seat at the table, but led by. Which is an important distinction. So exactly what does this legislation mandate needs to happen now? I'm really glad that you asked that question because there's a lot of misconception about what this legislation was intended to do and what the working group is charged with. So I first want to clarify that what the working group is charged with is creating a list of learning standards, educational standards for ethnic and social equity studies in schools. And standards are basically a list of gold star this is what your your curriculum should be aiming to fulfill it is not proficiencies proficiencies are a list of skills and capacities that students are supposed to have by the end it is not proficiencies it is not specific content so it doesn't itself change the content of what teachers teach in classrooms what books they choose um, what things they they choose to focus on the standards create expectations for what information what worldview what um I, I don't want to say content in the, in a concrete sense, but like what do what do we want students to walk away understanding and knowing by the end of their careers as students in our Vermont public schools? That's what standards are. So they are a they a goals list to work for. They're a guiding document, but they do not require specific actions within schools. The actions within schools is the work that the Vermont Coalition continues to do. So they continue to facilitate and help the people who are on the working group to do outreach and to gather community input and to just be resourced. But the work that comes after the standards is individuals and groups going into schools and asking how the schools intend to meet those standards. So that's where we get to ask, are there proficiencies that you're establishing? Um, how does your curricula intend to reach for those standards? Is there, are there any that are missing and what gaps do we need to fill? How might you fill them? So the standards group is really just creating the um, ideological difference, the, the container at the top that says, this is what we think you should be coming out of here knowing and then how you get to those is a is the matter of the grassroots work in communities in schools in classrooms that we all need to do henceforward and the standards themselves um we have about roughly two years from this point like into the 21 22 range to to finish and publish them um the timeline's a little wonky now because of the the COVID situation because it really kind of you know knocked some things off kilter schedule wise but um aside from that that's really the timeline we're on now there were 11 community members who were appointed by the coalition to serve on this work group and you're working with the agency of education and other state entities mm -hmm. so 
how is that working relationship going? Are, is the Agency of Education receptive to hear what the coalition members have to say and to contribute? Um, so I feel like that is a complex answer in the time that we are living in, which is that my experience of what um, it seemed like, and this is just my personal experience viewing um, from being part of the, the group, they they their process orientation their involvement was um different before the sudden shift in schooling where all of a sudden the entire statewide education system had to be online and figure out how to do everything in the world from online so i would say that there is um there is cooperation coming from the aoe but the AOE is also very intent on helping us to be clear and wanting us to make clear to others that we are again creating standards and standards do not dictate what happens in an individual classroom. We're actually a pretty decentralized state. We don't have a lot of um, really controlling guidance that comes down from the Agency of Education and instructs individual districts or schools or, or educators to do particular things. So I think that that has been something that the AOE has been trying to, to make very clear is that the AOE predominantly provides standards, resources, guidance for what we're trying to get out of the education system. And then the execution falls to superintendents, administrators, and the educators in the buildings. So Which is what, why our work is to create the standards and that that relationship with the AOE is going pretty smoothly. Um, and there's some mutual education that has to happen. There's lots of stuff about the agency of education and how education works and how education law work that those of us who are in community appointees do not already know. And there's lots of stuff about us as community appointees specifically because we represent uh, marginalized backgrounds that the AOE doesn't fully understand and realize. So it's a mutual education effort that is now taking place in, you know, an emergency backdrop, backdrop that didn't, wasn't the plan. Okay, so what that led me to for a question is, yeah. it sounds as though the intent of the coalition was to really bring about change within Vermont school systems you know what is being taught how it's being taught who who's being included in that process you working with the agency of education you're going to create a frame framework in which the coalition's work then really is going to kick into high gear because they're going to need to go out to individual school districts to advocate for specific inclusions and and maybe even recommendations for curriculums and be participants in that training process absolutely and i think that that um the point of the standards and sometimes people feel disappointed when they hear like wait you're not changing things in the classroom the point of the standards is to give people something to point to when they do the advocacy to give people something that says look the AOE and legislation in our state say that this is important and that these are the things that we are meant to be striving for. Without those, there's nothing that says that we need to be doing anything different than what we're already doing. So the standards are really intended to be the thing that we can now use to say, this exists. So me as an educator, I've been wanting to make change in my classroom, but I have an administration that doesn't work very well with me. I can now use these standards that are advocated by the agency of education as a tool to say this is why I'm making changes in my classroom I'm in adherence with trying to strive for these goals that are supported by educators throughout the state and it gives people different traction than they had before to make the inroads that we need to concretely and in classrooms and in hallways and in policies and if I heard you correctly you are still part of the coalition itself and that if there are individuals who by hearing this conversation say no no i really want to invest my time in working on that 
they could still join the coalition as an individual to participate in this process. A sort of broad question, is the coalition looking at creating a repository of curriculums that they think are good models in creating some type of available statewide resources that individuals could then go into their school district and advocate for inclusion of that curriculum? I do not know the answer to that because one of the things that is true is that I have pulled back some from my coalition um, involvement in order to focus that energy instead on working group involvement. So I'm not up to date on the details of exactly what the coalition is hoping to coalesce. Um, but I do know that they are very interested in getting people on board to do work. And they are also very interested in reimagining what work needs to be done moment to moment, because that's the, that's the entire point of grassroots organizing, is that it is capable of shifting and being nimble to address the things that are emergent. So it, what the plan is right now being educate people on what the standards are and how they can use them to advocate and then talk about what specific changes could be made in schools and how people should ask for them are only two of the things that we know need to be done right now. And there may be other things that, are, that, that become emergent or that as new people join and, and involve their energy and their passions and their knowledge um, become apparent that also need to be done. So I would say that the, the, the end all be all of what that coalition is, isn't even defined and settled yet because it has the capacity to move with the people who make it up. So what I'm strongly hearing from you is that this is not a point in time process. This is an ongoing evolutionary responding to, to continuously assess and responding to need and how do we, defining and then having to meet that need, which means since we've run out of time again, that as this work continues, you're going to need to come back and give us something. I think that sounds fair. This is not a moment, it's a movement, to quote Hamilton. <laughs> Thank you for your work. Thank you to your, for your commitment to our youth. And I look forward to bringing you back again. Absolutely. Hi. I'd like to welcome Julie Enzer, editor of Sinister Wisdom. Welcome, Julie. Welcome, I'm glad to be here. Um, so, just for the first question before I read some information from you uh, about you, um, is Sinister Wisdom now the longest running uh, lesbian publication, do you know? To the best of my knowledge, yes. Sinister Wisdom was founded in 1976 and we've been publishing issues pretty continuously since then. Yeah, I know it's very exciting to still have that publication with us. Um, mm -hmm. And just as an aside, one of my first poem was published in Sinister Wisdom by Adrian Rich. So I'm like, I'm, you know, very exciting. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so let me tell our audience about you. Julie Anzer is a scholar and poet. Her scholarship is at the intersection of US history and literature, with particular attention to 20th century US feminist and lesbian histories literatures and cultures by examining the lesbian print culture with the tools of history and literature and literary studies. She reconsiders history, histories of the women's literary, I'm sorry, women's liberation movement and gay liberation. Her book manuscript, A Fine Bind, Lesbian Feminist Publishing from 1969 through 2009, tells the story of a dozen lesbian feminist publishers to consider the meaning of the theoretical and political formations of lesbian feminist separatism and cultural feminism. So, welcome. And I see that you went to the University of Maryland. I did, that's where I did my um, MFA and my PhD. Okay, and did you teach at all or? 
I did. I, I taught there. I taught there, of course, the whole time I was going to school. And then for, I think, two years after, after I graduated, before we moved down here to Florida. And that, that's a good question. Why Florida? Uh, well, that's an easy question to answer. That's where my wife's company transferred her. So okay. we, came, we came down here. We live outside of Tampa, Florida. And um, so not to retire, although it is beautiful down here. I know. I, I went to the um, I went to t Tampa for a basketball championship a few years ago, and um, it's a great city. I really yeah. liked it. Yeah, yeah. the women's the, the NCAA women's Final Four. Yes, yeah, we were there. You were. Yeah, it was great fun. Yeah, and they have a lesbian area too. I know. Yeah, in Tampa. Okay, well, as I said. Um, Julie Enzer is publisher and editor of Sinister Wisdom, and it is one of the longest running publications. So how did you become editor and publisher of Sinister Wisdom? And why did you decide it was it would be a good thing to take on? Uh, well, I, I do like to joke that um, I became the editor and publisher of Sinister Wisdom because I was the, the last person standing who said yes. I like, I like to think that um, the editor before me went to everyone else on the planet and asked them first. Um, I started in, in 2010 um, as the editor and Fran Day um, asked me, I had been editing um, an issue, a special issue, um, well, she was the editor, and as, as we were getting ready to finalize that, she asked me if I would take over the editorial, uh, take over as the editor and publisher of the journal. And she, I knew that she had been sick, and she died a few months later. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's a little bit of, I thought about it a bit, and um, I, I mean, I thought about it enough to know that I had to be serious about it, that I wanted the journal to survive, that I didn't want it to... Um, fold or collapse under my editorship. So I knew that I had enough of a commitment to, to take it forward um, in that way. Um, and also, you know, I was in the throes of studying all of this wonderful lesbian feminist print work that happened during the 1970s and 1980s. And in one hand, I, I felt like sad that I missed that. Um, and so when the opportunity came up to be the editor of the journal, I thought I had the opportunity to create this, um, this sort of renaissance of lesbian publishing in my own life. And so that's the work that I've been trying to do for the past 10 years. And you've done a great job, I gotta say. Thanks. Yeah, we've, ex you know, we've expanded. Um, when I started, we did three issues a year. Now we regularly do four issues a year. Um, I think we'll do a couple extra special issues as we approach the 50th anniversary. So, um, you know. Wow, 50 look, years. Yeah. 2026, 50 years. Wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And so how, how has the pandemic affected, you know, like I see you're doing a lot more podcasts, which I guess is necessary at this time. But, you know, how, how are people responding to that? Are you getting a good response to podcasts? and? Yeah, so the podcast, so we're getting, so, you know, we started the podcast a little bit on a lark with a wonderful woman, Nadine um, Rodriguez, who's been an intern. Um, and I'm fascinated by podcasts, you know, like I listen to them and, um, and I, and I feel like there's a synergy between literary journals and podcasts. Um, I also have learned through our process of creating the podcast itself that, it's a huge amount of work to do really good audio. Um, on one hand, people have in their hands in the form of cell phones, great ways to record work, but stringing it all together, making it a really compelling 30 minute podcast is a, is a huge labor. So our podcast is a little bit on hold at the moment. When the pandemic hit, um, I mean, the first thing we did is just sort of um, batten down and stay in our house here in Tampa, Florida. And um, I was teaching on, I had been teaching online uh, even before that. So I was teaching and just trying to like wrap up the semester and um, do other work. 
Uh, but then as, as we got a couple weeks into the podcast, I know, or into the pandemic, I noticed all these people doing online events through Zoom. And I thought, Oh, we should maybe try this with the journal. So we were do so we were called on to do these these Zoom gatherings, and um, we did the first one for the April issue of the journal, and then and then we did one for the um, for She Wolf when She Wolf passed away, who was um, a, a friend of mine down here in Florida, one of the first lesbians I connected with when we moved down here. Um, and, and then we did another launch for our summer issue. And, and, um, as I said, it's like the lesbian potlucks, they can't get enough of them. So, uh, I haven't even announced it yet, but I'm planning another one for the end of August. Um, and we'll do one in the fall when the fall issue launches. And, you know, it's just part of a broader, um, I mean, Sinister Wisdom, our primary mission is to publish the journal and, and now we do it quarterly. Um, but I think our broader mission really is to promote lesbian art and culture and think about how um, artists and writers and people committed to lesbian culture can do um, that work in the world and connect with one another. And so we're trying, so I'm always interested in following different platforms and trying to find different ways where we can create opportunities to um, celebrate and help people create um, art and literature. And, you know, like, uh, I know that, you know, you've been, you've been doing, like, I noticed that you've been doing some themed um, uh, issues. And I didn't notice that before, like, the last few years. So is this something that you wanted to develop and that you are developing now? Uh, well, themed issues have always been a part of Sinister Wisdom since, um, actually, issue number two was the first themed issue edited by Beth Hodges. Um, and editors have used them in different ways um, over the different editorships of the journal. Um, I think one of the, there's, there's a variety of reasons um, I, we've been doing themed issues. One is it gives people space. It gives other um, lesbians an opportunity to edit and also to like create a vision for the type of conversations that they want to be having. The Southern Lesbian Feminist Activist History Project is a great example of that, where it's a group of women documenting Southern lesbian history that's been really vital for us. Um, of course, some of the other themed issues in the, in the past have been really influential. The issue that Beth Brandt edited about indigenous, uh, with indigenous yeah. women's voices. Um, and um, so, so it's really a way to engage more women in the work of editing and in the vision of shaping the magazine. Um, and particularly one of the things that I try to um, work on is inviting women of color to have, to edit different issues of the journal so that it's not exclusively my editorial vision as a white woman. Um, so yeah, so the themed issues have, have a lot of, have a lot of functions for us. Um, but we also always, like su submissions are always open for the journal. Um, I never shut them down. I go through, I try to um, get people responses within three to six months. Um, we accept work and we do open issues on a, on a regular basis as well. Um, it might not be a full issue, like 117 is actually three issues packed in one. It's a okay. great collection of um, writing about lesbians in the city. And then there's um, this whole lovely set of stories from the Southern Lesbian Feminist Activist History Project, and then there's new lesbian writing. Um, so it's kind of three mini issues all put together. Um, and yeah, so the themes are new and we, we try to envision them in different ways, um, but also try to be always open and publishing new interesting writing. Great. And speaking of writing, you are a prolific writer yourself. So for my last question, I would like to ask you how you find time to do all that you do with Sinister Wisdom and find time to write and publish. Uh, and do you have a book in the works? Uh, great question. Uh, you know, one of the, um, I think one of the things I always say, how I have time is that I didn't have children. 
And so there's actually like, there is a lot of time. That's also why I have three dogs. I didn't have children. I had a little extra time. I thought, oh, we'll, we'll just start collecting dogs. Um, no, I'm, um, uh, I, I don't, you know, people always ask how, how, uh, how do I do things that it's the usual writer thing. I try to set a time, set aside a little bit of time each day, even if it's only 20 or 30 minutes, first thing when I get into my office, um, to work on my own writing projects. And it's not the, the big projects that take the work, it's the little bit of time every day that then adds up. Um, and that's really what I try to do. Um, I have a couple projects in the work. I'm trying to get my academic book done with the history of the lesbian feminist presses. I'm working on another um, anthology project with um, a new collaborator, which I'm really excited about. We're not quite ready to talk about it yet, but we've been working a lot on it this summer. Um, and I'm writing a new, I did um, a sequence of poems that was published as a chapbook late last year called The Pink Okami Dyke, um, which were really this sort of series of persona poems um, that I had a great time with. And now I'm doing another, just this summer, sort of since the beginning of pandemic, I have a new series of persona poems that have been needling me in the back of my mind. And um, those are stacking up you know, that the 20 minutes a day are starting to stack up with those. So I'm hoping that in the next couple of months, that might be a more full manuscript. We'll see. You might have to just like make bigger slots. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, I want to thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. And um, this is our new show. This is our interview show. So um, thank you everybody for being here and for enjoying Julie and all the work that she does for our community. So thank you, Julie. Great, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking with you, Linda.